Be seated. It's a good song that's going to follow right into what we're going to talk about today. Have you ever noticed that some people seem to have a lot of joy in their lives? I mean, have you ever been around somebody where you're just like, wow, they just seem to be in a good mood, something about them that just seems like everything must be, I think this is how we translate it, everything must be going their way. Because they're just so happy, so filled with joy, and such in a good mood. Now, why is it that some people, and we'll talk about some Christians, are so productive? Why is it that some Christians can produce an abundance of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? I can't do the patience part, so don't uh, look at me for that. Some Christians produce a hundredfold of love, thirtyfold of patience, and sixtyfold of goodness. You know, my wife tells a story, and she still holds on to this, when she was growing up, when she was a teenager in the church, and, and this is important for all of us to hear, there was a lady in the church, she still talks about, that just seemed to have so much joy in her life. So much so that Jen, growing up, just always wanted to have what that lady had. There was just something about her that just kind of shone forth, just in who she was, her words, and her actions. And we, we know people like that, right? Yes? Been around or seen people that just seem to be that way. They just seem to be, like I said, I think we translate it to happy. Um, but people that just have some kind of joy about them all the time. I had a friend the other day told me of a lady that she had at church that was like that, was overflowing with joy, and she just couldn't figure out why she had so much joy and wanted to get some of that. Later she found out that the woman that had this much joy was going through some extreme hardship in her life that for most of us would produce anger, resentfulness, and yet for this lady still was producing joy in the midst of it. I think I've shared a little bit, I may have shared this all <clears throat> before, but I'm sharing it again. My first mission trip, the mission trip that we take our kids on every year, first time I went on it, I wasn't blessed to go on it in high school, I went on it, I was in my 20s, I uh, was actually leading before for my first one. But I was a young 20 year old and we went to this lady's house, everybody gets assigned a house, you all know the drill. And uh, she had her bathroom floor, she had a house that's one bathroom. So you had, you know, a, a, a tub, shower combination, toilet sink, and one room. But the floor had rotted in that room. So for her to use the bathroom or to take a shower, she had to go across the street to a friend's house. Now think about that for a moment. Think about you if you had only one bathroom at your house, if you had multiple and to use the bathroom, to use the toilet, you had to go walk across the street to your neighbor's house to do that. Every day for a couple of years to do that. Imagine living like that. And what she had talked about, what was interesting, the first thing that caught my attention is that her house shared property with a huge, large church. And it was right, the church's property was right there and hers was butted up against it. And she told us that, you know, she had been trying to get help from the city she tried to get help from local organizations that do help to do this, but she had literally been about two to three years with an unusable bathroom going across the street to her neighbor's house. She talked about how her uh, prayers were answered by a group of, of teenagers, just like our kids, that showed up to help make a difference. But what stood out for me was that her house was, I remember this is a 20-year-old kid, was disgusting by my standards. It, it was gross. I, I didn't want to touch anything. I didn't want to get anything on me because I, you know, I was blessed in a middle class family and, and kind of had an idea of what, you know, normal living, whatever it was supposed to be. And, and her house was just, at that time, disgusting. It was gross. I wore my gloves. I didn't want anything to get on me. She talked about how her two sons, she had two sons and both of them were in prison. So she was literally on her own. She had no help, no family. But, and as the kids I think have told you before, you know, we have devotions every day and she would come out and join us and she would talk about how blessed she was, how much God had blessed her and how much joy and happiness she had in her life. And as a 20-year-old, I'm sitting there thinking, man, lady, you don't know what joy is. You don't know what it means to be blessed. 
How can you possibly understand being blessed when you live like this? And it didn't make sense to that 20-year-old. You know, but as we continued through that week, she just continued to go on and on about how much God loved her and how blessed she was and how happy to have these kids come. And uh, at the end of our week, she, uh, she laid out a lunch spread for us. She made us lunch and probably spent a month or two worth of her budget on food. But she said that just God had blessed her in so many ways and she had the gift of cooking and she wanted to share that blessing with us. It had me really having to reflect as a young 20-year-old, what is happiness? What does it mean to be blessed? Because I think especially as uh, North American Christians, we equate being blessed with having. You're blessed if you have a nice house, and you have a nice car, and you can have a nice vacation, and you can have your kids be in 17 sports all at once, and you're paying for all that. That makes us blessed, right? And if you don't have that, if, if any of that's missing in our lives, then we're not blessed and, and we're frustrated and we're worried and we're stressed about life because we're not blessed. I was lucky at that age, not that I don't still struggle with those things, but I was lucky at that young age to, to find out something that blessing has to be more than what we have. It has to be more than material for this lady to just, to just ooze joy. I mean, she had it. She had joy in her life when, when my 20-year-old brain says she shouldn't have joy. You can't have joy without the things to, to, to go along with that. But I had to be confronted with, yet somehow she was joyful. She had a smile on her face every day. She greeted us with a smile. She greeted us with how blessed she was every day. What was it? Where does that come from? How can you produce those kind of blessings in life. That's what Jesus was trying to explain in our parable today, our story. Jesus loved to tell stories, masterful storyteller. I love his parables. Telling stories using everyday common items and examples. Something that people could easily relate to in their life. And um, yet that have a depth of meaning that we can just Gosh, you could spend a year going through each one. So Jesus tells one today a, a parable about a very foolish farmer. Those of you that garden, any gardeners in here? Just two. Some try. But any kind of gardening you do, any kind of planting, you know it, you, it takes work. It's not something you just do willy-nilly and go, oh, it'll be fine. Right? It, it takes intentionality. It takes work. It takes effort to make it. But not our sower today. What does our sower do? He just doesn't take any care or any caution about placing the seeds in the right spot. He seems to just throw them around indiscriminately. I thought about it, but I didn't want to take it on one-handed. I talked about this parable. I do parables a lot. Years and years ago, and while I told the parable, I walked around the congregation throwing seeds out. Um, the, the janitors weren't that crazy about it, but... Uh, no, just the seeds. I, I, I threw some larger kind of seeds, some kind of bean or something, and just walked out throwing the seed as I told the parable, indiscriminately tossing seeds everywhere. Um, and I thought about it, but I, I said, I'm going to take it on one-handed, so I, I thought I'll skip for today. So let's, uh, let's refresh ourselves to that. Jesus was out with a large crowd, as he was many times, and Scripture says he told many things to them in parables, saying this, Consider the sower who went out to sow. We can all imagine we have farms all over us. As he sowed, some seeds fell among the path. The birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't very deep. But when the sun came up, it scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it. Still other seeds fell on the good ground and produced fruit. Some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. Let anyone who has ears listen. 
I love that phrase of Jesus. I want to start adding it to the things I say. If anyone has ears, listen into my sermons. I thought that'd be great. So what does this parable mean? How could someone yield 30 bushels, 60 bushels, or 100 bushels? Is it possible? Jesus then gives explanation to the parable, and that's what we're going to look at. So the path. You know, we talked about you've seen people, know people that just seem to have joy. Have you ever just known people or seen people that are hard? Kind of hard-hearted? Yes. That I mean just, they're not happy about anything. Always complaining. Always worried. I mean, their hearts are hard to God. Their hearts are hard to the people around them. People just don't see any joy in their life. A lot of times those kind of people... Just like the people with joy that we may want to be close to and emulate, see those kind of people and we're just like, we don't want to be around them. Right? I mean, nobody wants to be around somebody that's just, that's just unhappy all the time with everything going on in their lives. People don't see joy. They don't want to be around. Now, the truth is, chances are those people aren't here in church today, but chances are you know people like that from work or school, your neighborhood, Maybe in your family, you have someone that's like that. You know, when you see people that have hard hearts, you get a sense from them that Christ is a waste of time, God's a waste of time, prayer is a waste of time, church is a waste of time for them. Anything to do with the, any, kind of, any kind of positive thing is a waste of time for them. If you talk to the people, these people about the poor, and the starving of the world, they could care less. If you tell them that 30 million students were served through the National School Lunch Program, they could care less. Their hearts don't care for people that are hurting. Because they most likely can't get past themselves. They're hurting, and they can't get past that because they don't have joy, and so they can't be joyful for anybody. Sometimes maybe if they're in our families, their hearts are hard to their own family. Lots of reasons people can come up with that hard heart. Jesus knew that. I mean, Jesus said, as we're going to come across these people, that these people are going to be out there, that even if we try to share the gospel with them, that even if we try to encourage them, even if we try to bring joy into their lives, they're just going to stay in that place. I mean, some people get there, don't get me wrong, some people get there for very valid reasons. Maybe they've had a big tragedy in their life. Jesus says, go and sow the seed of God, the word of God, but these people are just hard. They, they don't want that joy. They don't want that entering into their lives because they like that place they've gotten themselves in. Even though we can look and say, we know that's not healthy. But it provides comfort. Jesus says that there's those like the rocky soil. These people aren't really productive either. Those kind of people who are like the rocky soil, the seed, it said, comes up quickly. God comes up quickly. Maybe they have joy for a little bit. But then suffering and persecution comes in and takes it away. You know, there are some people that have the illusion that when you're a Christian, you have a better family, you have better kids, you have a better job, you have better everything. Some churches that even promote this, it's called the health and wealth gospel. And Jen's fond of saying, put on your running shoes and don't look back. You know, you find this kind of Christianity all over the TV that if you're just faithful enough, if you just give enough, then everything's going to be okay in your life. And I, and they're, I know it's like getting in the right direction, but missing the point. Because life's just not going to be that way. And I think that's where we struggle because, to be honest, to be honest, I think we think that because we go to church, because we give, we shouldn't have hardship. And I know there's a side of us that goes, yeah, yeah, but I know that's not true. Everybody has hardship. Yeah, but I know that's something we struggle with, too. I have a really good pastor friend of mine, uh, 60 years as a pastor. He's a, a leader now. His wife is a big Christian speaker. Um, and she's dealing with uh, cancer in her esophagus. 
and speaking is her life, and she may not be able to do that again. And, I mean, this is somebody that's, that I can look up to as a mentor, has done everything right, and he and I were having a conversation about what his family's gone through. And I think it's because of a, a book I was reading. I asked him, do you think, is there any part of you that thinks that this shouldn't happen because of who you are? And he said, yes. That if I'm honest, but that's one of my conversations with God. Look, I've given my life to you. I've preached your word for my whole life. I've done all these things for you because you called me and I did them. My wife you called and she's doing these things. She uses her voice to spread the gospel. Why? So it is. It, it, it hits all of us. I don't want to play any of this lightly. We all struggle with that. It comes in. That, that, that there should be some benefit. And that's what makes it hard to find the joy because when we get our mind into that, then you can't have joy because if, if you're facing those struggles and hardships and you got it thinking that it's not fair because I love God, why is God doing this to me? It's hard to have joy in that midst. We've lost our focus. Anybody ever heard of fair weather fans in sports? We know those, right? We just love the team when the team is winning. We'll wear the jerseys, we'll wear the hats, the gear. But if it's one of those years as they all cycle where they just can't do anything right and they're going to be in last place, we're kind of like, oh yeah, let's not talk about them. Right? Well, they're fair weather Christians too. Those that love God and believe in God when life gets tough, they struggle. As long as their health is good, their family is good, their kids are good, their grandkids are good, their jobs are good, then they're happy. And they have joy in Christ. When that weather gets nasty, when tragedy hits. You know, and that's back to we know that. We know God doesn't give us tragedy. We know we live in a sinful world and that happens. And God is with us. But we still struggle with that. The purpose of Christian faith is not to insulate us from tragedy, but it's to make us strong in the midst of tragedy because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Because he gives us the promise that whatever tragedy we're going through isn't the end. It isn't what defines us. But some fair-weather Christians just don't understand. Jesus also, I, I think, in here is talking about, I put in here, um, what I call quickie Christians. People that may be going through some kind of hardship in life and they've not been Christian before. But then there's this kind of thought of, well, we've tried everything else. We've tried all the doctors. We've tried everything we can think of. So let's, let's say a prayer. That's what people do. Maybe turning to God might make a difference. And of course, what they want is they want to see that change. If that change doesn't happen, then it didn't matter. You know, we saw a lot of quickie Christians right after 9-11. I'll tell you, lots of books right about this. Church attendance has boomed. Within one year, in that one year period after 9-11. But then at the end of that one year period, attendance went back to pre-9-11 numbers. Quickie Christians. Right? There's tragedy. Oh, we need God. We need God because there's been this tragedy. This happens. We're fearful. We're worried about our country. We're worried about our lives because this stuff's going on. Let's turn to God. Okay, life's gotten back to normal. Okay, great, good. I'm done. Quickie Christians. Just there in the rocks. Third kind of story says is that there's some of us that have been, the seeds have come in the weeds, and the weeds choke them out. If you're a gardener or have plantings around your house, you know all about weeds. Dan will tell you, I've always wanted this. I'm trying to get us to do this here. Just turn everything into grass. So all you got to do is mow everything down. That way you can keep the weeds down. Instead of trying to keep flower gardens and all things you got to fight weeds for because you always lose the battle with weeds. Right? Anybody won the battle with weeds? The problem with weeds is they're very aggressive. They're very hardy. You know, I find it extremely frustrating. And we see this in this here more. You know, it's the summertime. It gets hot and the grass starts to get brown. Your planting starts to get brown. But of course, you look in the middle of your driveway cracks and what do you see? The nice green weeds just growing and thriving. They get bigger and bigger. Weeds are inevitable. You can't get rid of them. Believe me, I try. 
Jesus says where the weeds are. The weeds are the cares of the world and the lure of wealth. And how he finally gets into a little stepping on toes, I think, Jesus does. Let me tackle the cares of the world first. I think the cares of this life are ones we fall into from time to time. We are all in that busy rat race, aren't we? Thinking about this, you know, I don't remember how we managed life with three kids. Because we got two now, we got to get rid of one. We got two now, and yet, between those two, they have something Monday through Friday, every night. And then on the weekend, you hit games during basketball and soccer season. And there's no time. Where does it all go? We're running around, hectic, from time to time. Family dinners are a struggle. I had uh, some friends at my last church, they had two kids, and they would talk about their week. It frustrated them, rushing to get one to this practice, one to another rehearsal. Wife and husband going each of their own ways, being involved in different committees and different meetings. Week in, week out, they don't see each other. They're lucky to have one meal a night, a week, where they can be all together as a family. And spending time with God as a family is all but left out. You know, in contrast, the same church had a friend that intentionally, this was their family plan always from the beginning, they would only let their child do one thing. One thing, one sport, one after school activity, that was it. And, and as husband and wife, they each could pick a thing that they were part of, a, a committee or a, a meeting, a group that they attended, because they wanted to set intentional guidelines to say that that's not the priority in our life as a family. Our priority is our family and, and God. We're not going to let things of this world choke out what's most important in our life. That's hard. You may hear that and go, oh gosh, what, what things should I have not let my kid done? Really? And I think we fall into that belief that we have to keep up. If my kid's not playing six sports, then he's not going to be uh, as look as nice to go to college so that he goes to college and, and become productive. What kind of productive productivity do we want from our kids? Are we worried about the productivity they're going to have through their relationship with God, or are we worried about the productivity they're going to have in relation to the world? I get it. It's hard. Obviously, you're saying we're not, we're not surviving it. We're not putting limitations on it. Because it's hard. We want what's best for our kids. But is what's best for our kids to be successful in the world's eyes or to be successful in God's eyes? Do we want them to be a wonderful citizen of the world or a wonderful citizen of God's kingdom? What's going to choke out their relationship with God? What's going to choke out our relationship with God and not let us have that focus? You know, the second problem Jesus says with these seeds is some of them are lured with wealth. You know, something I hear from a lot of families is always being short on money. And I, had, I don't know if this holds true for you, and I just had this thought this morning. I was thinking back to maybe the year before uh, um, COVID hit. And I can remember in the year, a couple of years before COVID hit, talking as a family about the struggles of finances. Right? Maybe you were then, too, before COVID. And then COVID hit, and now we're in a world where all, those, all expenses have gone through the roof. And we're still at the same place talking about how hard it is. And granted, it's changed, but it hasn't really. Or is it the mindset that we use? Is it back to that need we have to prove that we are successful by what we have and what we can get? You know, as children grow, our demands on finances become more and more. But are they justified? Is it still so difficult for us, even though we know it's not what we should do? We teach our kids about keeping up with the Joneses. But do we find ourselves falling into that trap again and again? That if we don't take the right vacations. And I just find it fascinating. It had me thinking about just how society has changed. 
I know when my grandparents got married, they both got married in their parents' backyard. A lot of folks got married in small chapels. You know, the average wedding today, the average wedding is looking at fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for the average wedding. How did we go from getting married in the backyard with family and the preacher showing up to needing fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to have a wedding? Does that make it a better wedding? Does that mean the $20,000 wedding is going to last? And of course, the truth is, if we're honest, no. Because those, those folks that got married in the backyard right after World War II lasted a whole lot longer than 51% of the population is la- lasting today throwing $10,000 weddings. But we've got to keep up. When I was a kid, going on vacation meant going to Grandma's house. I mean, that, that was vacation. Maybe once every few years we'd get to do something like Disney or something big. Now it seems like that has to be the norm, that every spring break, every fall break has got to be the Bahamas, has got to be going to some foreign country. Bigger, bigger, more expensive. And we feel this pressure to keep up with that. Better house, better car, better vacation. You know what the problem is, though? In one part of our head, we think that's what's going to make happiness for us. Yet in the process of always doing those things, we're we're worried about where the finances are going to come, how we're going to make ends meet, trying to keep up with doing all those things. And there goes the joy. Because while we may enjoy doing the event, then we stress the rest of the year on how to pay for it and how to cover it. And it's hard to have joy. The weeds are always going to be there. You know, we have these uh, in our, our driveway and the sidewalk, and it's you know slabs, and the weeds love to grow in between them, in those cracks. And I'm a I'm a gentle tell you I'm a weed fanatic. I hate weeds. So I've bought every different kind of product they are. We've done home research. You know, if you mix this and mix this, you could put them on that. And everything promises. You know, if you put this down, there won't be weeds there for four to six months. But you know, it seems like I'm spraying those cracks in the sidewalks about every two or three weeks to keep the weeds down because neither matter how you soak them with that weed killer, they come right back. It's not something you can just fight once. I can't just go out at the beginning of the season, spray those corners and say, oh, I'm done with those for the, for the season, right? That's what those weeds do. They just keep coming. They're persistent. We have to be intentional about engaging and eliminating those weeds. It's so easy to just let them grow. It just happens. All of a sudden we find the things that are important being choked out. But Jesus says for some there's good soil. Soil that produces fruit in abundance. Fruit that's able to prosper and produce seeds to continue a harvest. Who has the best garden? Somebody that just goes out and tosses seeds around in the backyard? Or somebody that's meticulous in cultivating the soil and preparing it, putting the right kind of chemicals in there and the right kind of manure to make sure that when those seeds are put in, which are put in perfectly spaced in little holes and covered and watered, will grow. It takes a lot of work. I don't know if anybody has done it, Jen and I did once, and Virginia did the, got into the square foot gardening. I had to build all these boxes in the backyard, and we had to look up, and you get so much dirt and so much hummus and so much this and this, this to put into it to get the soil just right. And, and it did. You know, when you follow those directions and you got that soil prepared properly, and you put some screens around it to keep the deer out and the rabbits out, you could have a great garden that produced an abundance of fruit. I mean, we were big green bean people, and we produced five-gallon bucket after five-gallon bucket of green beans. But it didn't come by just stumbling across it. It came through a lot of work. It came through a lot of intentionality. It meant having to go out and pull weeds out from under the plants. It meant being intentional about having that garden grow. 
And if you don't put in the work, you can't enjoy the rewards. If you don't have good soil, you won't bear good fruit. That's what Jesus was saying. It's a choice we have to make. All these things are going to interfere with that process. And we can either let them, and maybe we stop at points in time and look back and go, man, look at all the time we spent chasing X, Y, Z. Really didn't make us happy. People are watching you. And I opened up with talking about Jan and LA at church that watched in other words. Our kids are watching you. Kids are watching their parents, but our kids at church are watching you. Are you going to be the kind of person that's here that our kids look at and go, man, I want what they have. That's something that only you can do. It's that place you've got to get to to decide what are your priorities. What are you going to work on in life? What's going to be first? You know what I learned and still struggle with, I'm saying, not, not, being, not being honest, but from that 20-year-old kid, I learned that those things can't give joy. That that joy that that lady had in that house that I worked on didn't come from anything around her in, in the physical sense. It wasn't from her living conditions. It wasn't from the conditions of her family. She didn't have the perfect family. She didn't have the perfect house. She didn't have a car. She didn't have anything that we associate with being successful to be joyful. Yet she found joy because she found it in a God that loved her so much that he sent his son to die for her. And because he did that, she could have joy in this life because she knew she was loved. She knew she was loved beyond anything anyone can imagine. And that gave her joy. Do you have that kind of joy? People are looking at you. What are you putting forth? Sower went out to sow. Some seeds fell on the path and the birds came and ate them up. Some seeds fell on the rocky ground where there was no depth of soil. The plants grew up but withered away when the sun rose. Some seeds fell among the weeds. They grew up, but they were choked out. Some seeds fell among the good soil where they produced grain, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. You have ears. Listen. Let's pray. Lord, you know we struggle. That's why you sent your son to, to teach us how we can be in relationship with you, to teach us how to live life on this earth, to give us some guidance and direction, to show us how to live with our brothers and sisters around this world. And after showing us and giving that example, he went to the cross for us. He died. And we, we know that he died so that we could have salvation. We could have eternity with you. But we forget he also died so that we could live life to the fullest now while we're here on this earth, so that we could have joy, knowing that, that that feeling of unconditional love should prompt us to just be a per people that, that exude joy, that exude happiness, that look at life as a blessing and love to share that with others. Jesus has called us to produce fruit fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Lord, help us, help us to produce that fruit which you've called us to each and every day so that others see us and want to know more. In Christ's name.